thank you to Audrey for inviting us to come speak. Um, so this is the talk that we gave at IA Summit in Atlanta in May, and so we're excited to be able to say it again in front of you guys. Um, so yeah, this is Virginia, and she's our content strategist on the UX team at Shopify. And this is Kylie, and she's a designer, and she also works on our UX team. So today we're going to talk about what to do when you're faced with an IA project that feels way over your head. About a year ago now, Kylie and I were faced with this problem when we were given the task of improving Shopify reports for our 275,000 plus merchants. But before we get into how we uh, tackle that, we'll give you a bit of context on the project as well. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with what IA is, it uh, stands for Information Architecture. <laughs> Yeah, so, if you're not, so for those of you who aren't super familiar with Shopify, we're a commerce platform for small, medium, and even very, very large businesses. Um, our merchants can use Shopify to design and manage their stores across multiple sales channels, including online stores, social media, physical locations, you name it. So yeah, actually, if you have something you want to sell, uh, we make it possible, pretty easy for you to do it anywhere and any way that works for you. So if you were a merchant and you logged into Shopify, the report section is a place where you would go and get the data and generally gauge how your store is doing. Some merchants use this data to do their taxes or look for trends on how a particular product is selling. And you might be thinking this doesn't look so bad. And you're right, our old reports weren't too much safer, but there were a few problems with the overlay of experience. So for one thing, there was a huge disconnect between our merchant's tasks and their data. As you can see here, uh, we just kind of gave them a long laundry list of reports that may or may not help them accomplish the task. Um, let's say a merchant was looking to answer the question, what are my best performing products so I know what I should order tomorrow? They might be able to navigate successfully to the product sales section, but not be entirely confident on which of those three reports to click on to get the answer. Like, what's the difference between gross sales by product title and gross sales by product bearing skew? Like, we don't, we don't really even know. <laughs> <laughs> and on the off chance that a merchant did find what they were looking for, we would let them down with really bad data visualizations. We literally showed bar charts for every type of data, and I'm sure, as you can imagine, that broke down pretty quickly. So can you tell from this data viz what products are trending and which ones you should order more of? I'm guessing we don't. So as I mentioned, we knew a few things that just weren't working when we started out on this project. But we also knew that we didn't want to recreate Google Analytics or Tableau. And don't get me wrong, we love Google, but we didn't want our merchants to need um, training or be analytics experts to use our, our reports. They had to be approachable for people with all different levels of reporting knowledge. Now, while all of this presented a really exciting challenge, I mean, who doesn't want to build an improved e-commerce experience for Kanye? It did mean that we had to figure out how to create reports that were sophisticated enough for Kanye or Tesla's analytics team, but also approachable enough for my friends like necklaces and raisins. And although this felt a bit overwhelming, we discovered that you can actually turn complex projects into approachable projects for you and your users, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So first, let's talk about how we land complexity into Shopify reports. When we started working on the Shopify reports project, it didn't take long to realize we were dealing with a pretty complex IA. Um, we had data spanning several categories from payments and taxes to conversion and traffic. So first, we had to figure out what information we were dealing with and define the high-level architecture. So let's talk about what this is all. We spent, so we spent a lot of time looking at like which reports currently existed on Shopify. We took something we called a bus matrix, which looks like this, um, which our data friends handed over to us to understand how the dimensional modeling was working. But if you're like me, you're probably like, what the heck is this? Um, what I learned was that it's essentially showing us all the ways you can slice and dice a report. For example, on the sales reports, you can slice the report by your engagement, cut, like all kinds of stuff. And after this, we figured out what this actually was. We ripped it all apart and broke it down into information objects and started to make sense of it from a user task-based perspective. We also looked at what information objects were shared across different reports and how we were referring to them. 
So, for example, in our product sales reports, we were using the term gross sales, and in our order sales report, using the term sales. Were these the same numbers, or were they actually different and required the same things? And it turned out in the end that they were the same, and we were just being sloppy. We also started to consider how, how these categories might talk to one another. For instance, how related were our categories? Was products just a filtered version of sales, or were they truly different? Should we cross link between our categories and so on? We also did a competitive analysis, or tried to do one. But what we realized is that most reporting software out there is really focused on one user. The accountant, the SEO expert, the person who has 10 weeks to spend in training before they actually use the software. There really wasn't anything out there that gave us all the answers, which would have been really nice. So instead, we used our competitive analysis to take note of things that we didn't want to do. We would have tool tips all over the place to describe financial terms. And also some things we did want to do, like save our favorite reports that we use all the time. Now getting back to the mapping. When we were trying to figure out what the information landscape looked like for reports, we actually did map up every piece of information to the F degree. But looking back on it, we really didn't need to go to that level of detail at this point of the project. We could have learned enough by mapping out just the highest level categories and fully mapping out just one or two categories, for example, finances and inventory, and then the rest is removed along with the project. Um, this is a really cool tool, by the way, that you made by MindMeister, if you're interested in it. I am happy. So don't do what we did. Instead, do just enough mapping. Get to the point where you have a sense of how your users will move through the information. Just map enough to get an image, of, an image in your mind of what the information landscape looks like. For example, are there three main categories, or are there actually 12? Does the content within these categories overlap, or is it unique to each category? So the key finding we came around with from our mapping exercise was that there were two overreaching tasks that would determine how our information was organized. We discovered that our merchants are almost always either trying to understand how their store is performing, for example, how much did my store make this week, or they're trying to conduct a business operation. For example, I need to do my taxes. And once we figured out what information we were dealing with, we had to decide what part of it to tackle first. But before we started to prioritize anything, we wrote down all of our project truisms. These truisms might reiterate uh, best practices or design decisions you've already landed on with your team, or maybe they'll come from your competitive analysis. Either way, there should be things that you can all agree on to be true about your project. Things that no matter where your design decisions take you, they need to be factored in. For us, these were guiding statements, like Shopify reports do the hard work from merchants. Shopify reports can be organized by merchant class. Shopify reports can be saved and favorited, and other statements like these. These truisms really helped us to come together on a vision and stay on track. The other thing that helped us um, prioritize our work was just getting started getting together outside of the office. For our team, this happened one day when we just finished a two-day training workshop, and we were all feeling really good about our newfound knowledge, but also pretty drained and in need of a break. So a group of us, including data, data analysts, UXers, engineers, product managers, we all went to a nearby pub to let off some steam. But of course, instead of chatting about what we were going to do that weekend, we started talking about our reports project and how it was a lot of and it was during this chat that we realized we wouldn't actually be able to build and design the whole thing all at once. Instead, we needed to find the easiest thing to build that would provide the most value for our merchants. Soon the word finances came up as an area that was a real pain point for our merchants, and something our engineers agreed we could actually tackle in the short term. Now, prioritizing your project and rolling it out incrementally might not sound like a groundbreaking to read moment. But this turned out to be a really important realization for our team. We both remember walking away from the pub feeling such a sense of relief. Like, oh my god, we don't need to solve it all right now. We can just do finances and figure out the rest later. So that's what we did. We thought big and we started small. We built out one piece of our information architecture, which for us was finance reports, and got it to the point where it was ready to implement. And it turned out this was actually a really great thing for our users. Don't forget that even if you have something to copy, your users might have become really good at navigating and even teaching each other how to navigate that crappy thing. Even if it's not efficient, they probably know exactly what seven things they need to click on to do their end of day reporting. Jared's school describes this uh, very thing one of his medium articles about an engineering design, 
and it's so true for pretty much any project. He says, everything changed on the day of the new designs launch. All of a sudden, everyone's current knowledge was shifted back, almost to the point of a brand new employee. And this was something that we had to avoid. By focusing on finance reports and rolling those out to our users before anything else, we not only gave ourselves something manageable to work with, but we also allowed our merchants and their employees to adapt to a new experience. So even though we were dying to rip this page apart, our merchants were actually really familiar with it, so it had to disappear in stages. And you'll notice that the before and after aren't all that different. We introduced a new finance section and presented it in a more user-friendly way uh, with a plain language description of what a merchant could expect to find in that section. And slowly we did revise the rest of this landing page so that each new section looked more like the finance section. And we'll actually give you a demo of the work we've done since then. At the end of this. Uh, so another good reason to roll out your project in increments is that you can get all the good things you've been working on out to your users faster. Otherwise, if we'd waited until everything was perfect and finished, we would still be at this three years from now, and we'd be holding back valuable updates from our merchants. You also run the risk of discovering the thing that you've been working on all this time is actually not the right thing at all. So again, we layer complexity into our project to make it more approachable by first figuring out what information we're even dealing with, and then mapping out the high-level architecture. By defining and prioritizing our tasks, it was a manageable place to start, and also by continuing to think big as it starts off. So the second way we made this complex project more approachable was by integrating design, content, and research from day one. So what does this look like? Well, at Shopify, we use a product development process to help the company get work done and scale. You can find similar processes at many other companies, but I think one thing that we do that's key to success is that we include all disciplines from day one. So this is the flow of our product development process. Um, we spend time in the idea phase together uh, where we first gather initial thoughts on what impact this project could have and the reasons for creating the project in the first place. This starts with analyzing merchant feedback and narrowing in on the problem that we need to solve. We then move on to the think phase together where we become experts on the problem domain, both within and outside Shopify. For us, this involved the whole team. <laughs> the whole team piling into a room to take a two-day course on data visualization. One of the reasons we started the project in the first place was to improve how we were showing merchants their data. Because clearly we weren't doing a very good job of it. So after taking the course, we were equipped with the tools to know when to show what type of data visualization. And for you, this might not be data biz, but no matter what the subject is, Either take a course or do a lot of research into the subject, subject matter with your fellow members. Um, so we also put time to interview accountants to get a sense of what their workflow looked like. To do this, we jumped into our cars, we drove around Ottawa, and we took printouts of our wireframes uh, to accountants who were familiar with Shopify reports, and we sat down with them to see if it all made sense. And I think it was important that we all did this together, rather than having our researcher go out on her own and bring back the findings for us. Because by physically being there, uh, we got to watch them struggle through our flows, misinterpret the terminology, and ask questions as it was all happening. This helped us gain a collective understanding of the struggles our users faced. Now, even though we were all working collaboratively, it was actually really important for us to let content lead the way once we got into the work phase. We found that it's actually pretty common, especially in a startup environment when you're shipping fast, Jump right into designing or building the thing before even, even really thinking about it. Instead, think about what your users need and what content you need to offer them to, to meet those needs. Lay it all out before you even think about whether that thing will be a button or a link or what have you. And even once we've gone through the idea, think, and explore phases together, it was tempting still to ditch our team members and go off into the corner and design. But don't do this. Keep, instead, keep these people close as you're working through your designs. And vice versa. If you're a researcher, invite some engineers or content uh, people to listen to in on your next user interview. We found that by keeping other teams involved, what we were doing not only helped speed things up in the long run, but it also brought some fresh eyes to our work. So again, we integrated design, content, and research to make our project more flexible by including everyone in the beginning and everyone 
by letting the content take away, and finally by not getting trapped or just So now, even, even though we followed all of these steps and we're feeling pretty comfortable with our team, there were still moments where we felt completely overwhelmed and vulnerable. But it turns out, if we embrace these feelings and empathize with our team members, when they're feeling vulnerable, we actually end up building something way better in the end. So even though we all know from people like Bruce Brown, should check that out, um, that we should embrace all vulnerability, how does this actually create a better product? Well, I don't know about you, but when I'm feeling vulnerable or overwhelmed or really unsure of myself, I typically close up. And I think unintentionally, I work pretty hard to make sure that the people around me don't suddenly realize that I don't have the answers. But this doesn't help anyone, and it definitely doesn't help the thing I'm working on get any better. So one thing that we did on this project to embrace vulnerability was to show up our work to pretty much anyone who would listen. And even when our tendency was again to close up, we really forced ourselves to show up at work. And you can get to that point with your work too. Instead of shying away from that thinking feeling, use it as a signal to know that it's time to talk through your work with someone. Talking about these three points, not only gave us a way to get help on the areas that needed it, um, but also helped us to become intimately familiar with what we were working on and more confident in our design choices. Something we do at Shopify um, to show our work is hold weekly UX meetups called Fresh Eyes with groups of about 10 people. These Fresh Eyes sessions are mandatory, so you can't flank out, and everyone's expected to share something, even if it's just a few thoughts on the page. And when we present at Fresh Eyes, we're expected to tell everyone what stage of the project we're at. For instance, just starting out or almost ready to implement. So this sets the expectation so you don't feel really bad about showing really early work, just like sketches or wireframes. Um, but if you don't have a big UX team with lots of fresh eyes like we do, that's okay. You can just grab a friend or someone else that you know really well and, and, yeah, <laughs> and talk them through it. <laughs> but to make the product better, we didn't only need to open up with our fellow UXers, we also need to embrace vulnerability with our project. When we did that was with a bi-weekly health check. So these health checks are a way for us to get together with our team and go around the room and figure out what, talk about what is and isn't working on the project. This is a really good way for us to share honest feedback as well as uncover pain points and figure out how we can fix them. So we use an app to record our health checks. Uh, looks similar to this one here. Um, but you don't have to have a fancy app to do this. You can just all get together and talk about it. For us, these health checks often end up feeling more like group therapy sessions than a team meetup. Even though it would be easier to go into a health check and say, yep, everything's good here, we actually celebrate and encourage the more honest and quickly feedback because that's how our product improves. For instance, a good health check where we're all being really open and honest can save what would otherwise be weeks of emailing back and forth or not even being aware of a problem until it's too late. So again, we embrace vulnerability to make our project more approachable by first showing off our work to people outside of our team, and secondly, by checking in with our team often and honestly to discuss how the project was doing. Today we talked about a few ways that helped us make our complex project more approachable, by layering complexity to help our team and our users um, approach content chaos, by integrating design content and research from day one, and by embracing vulnerability from ourselves, our team, and even our work. So that we hope that the next time you're feeling overwhelmed by a really complex project, you'll be able to use some of these methods to make it more approachable, not only for yourselves, but also for your users. And if all of these things seems too daunting right now, just try stop stopping someone in the hallway and showing them what you've been working on. It might feel really silly the first time, but just try it and see where it takes you. So this is, we finished this talk at IA Summit, like a bit was in May, and since then we've done like a whole bunch of work on this page here. Um, so we wanted to give like a demo of what it looks like now. Yeah. So this is what it did look like before we started any of it. So this was the first digital finances. Yeah, so 
the one at the bottom is the first thing that we bit off. This was like when we went to the pub, we were like, this is the thing we can do first. Um, so it doesn't seem to be a lot. If you click into the finance summary, it looks pretty like, basic, and there's not a lot there. Uh, but it actually took us a long time to get to this very like simple layout where it's just showing absolutely every number of the merchant agency to do like their taxes and make sure they were like the right numbers and where they drove into it. We also had to determine for each of these reports, like which column we have first, and if we wanted to like link through to other sections. So in this one, you can see that the orders are actually linked through too. So you can go to this report and then see the order. So it looks pretty like boring, if you, but like for people that need to do their accounts, it's like super amazing and they're they really love it so we've had some really good feedback so far we've been like monitoring and that as it comes in making small changes to it but nothing crazy came out of it is that people just love it. yeah love this report so we love that um, since the team we've also had time to kind of like revise the entire page um a big thing that came out of our research so i don't think we should be is that people kind of needed like some kind of insight into what they were going to get before they clicked into one of these reports. So right, like they were clicking through, clicking into one, realizing there was no data in it, clicking out, clicking through, clicking back, like not really knowing what they were going to find. So there's like zero indication of like what data is going on. Yeah. So we were able to give them more of a pulse on what was actually happening with their store. And if they click into one, for example, sales by month, they knew how many orders that they, they were going to see if they clicked through to that. So it's sort of, yeah, opening up, giving them a little bit more insight to what they were going to see. Yeah. So yeah. this is what we moved a bit by like, the layering and complexity. So you can see like a little bit at the top. And if you want to learn more, you can dig into it more rather than like showing them nothing and then everything. So like gradually. 